Thank you very much. Are there any town are there any town meeting members who have yet to be sworn in? If so, please rise. Okay, looks like everybody's sworn in. Um, <clears throat> We're going to have a clicker test vote. Take out your clickers. Yay. Make sure they're turned on. So tonight's test vote, as soon as our, we have two guys from OTI tonight. We're trained in replacements. As soon as they're ready, they're going to give me a signal. And our test question is going to be, do you think the Patriots will win the pennant this year? One for yes, two for no. The Patriots, <laughs> the Red Sox. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> I think the Red Sox are going to win the pennant this year. I'm seeing if you're awake. Oh, go ahead and vote, I guess. Then we run through the screens afterwards on this vote. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, check to make sure your device is working properly. Yeah, I think, oh, I got a yes, okay. No, oh, looks like they're going to win. That's we have 50, 125, 140, 151. And we have a quorum. All right, I recognize the um, vice chair of the board of selectmen, Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Mrs. Mahan and many others are still in the task force enrollment committee, and I apologize, and I apologize for not being here. It is moved that if all of the business of the meeting, as set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting, is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Wednesday, May 4th, 2016, at 8 p.m. All in favor of adjourning to May 4th, 2016, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? It's a vote, and I so declare it. Mr. Dunn? No, oh, you just did that. Oh, we don't have to do that second thing. Okay, do we have any re um, announcements or resolutions? Pluso. Did you have an announcement, Mr. Pluso? Ted. Good evening, my name is Ted Peluso. I'm from precinct number six, if I remember. In uh, any event, I wanna show you something. If you folks wanna stop by the visitor center, you will find that we have as many attractions, maybe more so, than Lexington, okay? Now, the reason I'm here and thank you for the time, uh, John, is to tell you that I've lived here for approximately seven years, and in those seven years, some of the happiest times I've spent, probably 100, 200 hours, has been in the visitor's center. We are looking for volunteers to come by, and here's what happens if you show up. You can come for two hours, you can come for one hour, you can come once in a while. We're usually open only on the weekends. But here's what happens. You meet people from all over the world, and I mean that literally. And you tell them about good stuff, no criticisms. And then the children show up with them. And the children are like a sight to behold. They run around the place. Uh, if you were there for Halloween, uh, a year and a half ago, you guys would have been crazy about it. 
It was unbelievable. So if you like people, either talk to Angelo Olszewski or myself. Uh, we're on the list of town meeting members. We have our emails. We have our tough cell phones there, regular phones. Give us a call. We'd like you to come and help out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pluso. Any other um, announcements or resolutions? Mr. Warden. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, John Warden, Precinct 8. I had an announcement about, well, a third announcement really about the longevity of the representative town meeting. Um, actually, it was in 1935 that the town adopted the standard form of town meeting. But, so that was 80 years ago. So we had 80, 80 under that, that format. But in, in, it actually goes back a few years before that. In 1920, the, the, the open town meeting was here in this hall, as they always had been. Uh, and the place was so filled with people, they were practically hanging from the rafters, is what we were told. And of course, the room was a little larger because we didn't have the elevator kind of sticking into it. Anyway, the, the, the subject that drew so many people here, and that was a very substantial percentage of the town's population in those days, um, guess what? School construction. We're bu building the, talking about building the junior high school. Um, so after that, they, they said, this is getting kind of out of hand. We should go to a representative, or what they used to call a limited town meeting. So they petitioned the legislature and this was a, a fairly rare and new thing, but I guess there were a couple others before us. And, in, and the legislature passed a law allowing Arlington to adopt limited town meetings, and which they did in a vote in February of 1921, uh, so that they would have had their last open town meeting uh, that year, and the following year they would have gone to representative town meeting. So this would be the 94th representative town meeting if I did the math correctly. And if that's correct, I've been here for half of them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Gorham. Thank you. Good evening. Maureen Gormley, Precinct 20. I'm rising to put on my other hat tonight as a member of the Arlington Chamber of Commerce. I've been a member for more than 25 years, and proudly announcing we are celebrating 100 years as an Arlington Chamber of Commerce. We will be having a celebration in October, on October 6th, and we need your help. How we need your help is we want to nominate, have some of you nominate who you think would be the best citizen of the year for our 100th anniversary. So I have information that you can get from me you just go online to uh, arlcc.org and nominate somebody you think is worthy of being Citizen of the Year. Thank you and hope to see you in October. Thank you. Any other announcements or resolutions? Okay, the only announcement I have is that if you're precinct 1 through 14, you should have already organized and turned in your organizational slips to the clerk. If you haven't organized your, any of 1 through 14, please do so at the break. You all got a slip showing you where you're supposed to organize. Um, just go out and meet there at the break and please organize. Thank you. Um, any other announcements or resolutions? Seeing none, reports of committees. Mr. Tosti. Oh, Mr. Gilligan, you're next. In the back of the hallway is the Finance Committee recommendation on the Minuteman School Building Project. It's six pages, uh, two-page analysis or description, the uh, vote, and then some uh, spreadsheets for you to review. Uh, we will be taking the, these uh, issues with Minuteman, both the budget and the building, on uh, Monday, as, as hopefully as soon as the meeting starts. Uh, so, Mr. Moderator, I move that these uh, amended report be uh, received. Second. All in favor receive the amended report of the Finance Committee, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is so received. Mr. 
Mr. Gilligan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Stephen Gilligan, Town Treasurer. Also on the back of the hall on the table are 300 copies of the Treasurer's Report to Town Meeting. Mr. Moderator, I move that the report be received. All in favor of receiving the report of the Treasurer, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is so received. Thank you, Mr. Thank Gilligan. you, Mr. Moderator. Any other reports of committees? Seeing none. Uh, okay, that's going to do that. Uh, Mr. Tosti? Move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. All in favor of laying Article 3 upon the table, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Article 3 is laid upon the table. That brings us to Article 18. We have a bylaw amendment, Article 18, expanding the equal protection rights for, under the Human Arlington Human Rights Commission. Anyone want to speak to this? Human Rights Commission? Nobody? All right. I guess no one wants to talk about it. That's fine. We have, oh, yes, Ms. Barron wants to talk about it. Hi, Sherry Barron, Precinct 7, and member of the Human Rights Commission. I would like to um, ask that a member of our commission, who is a resident of Arlington, obviously, come up and speak just briefly about this. Her name is Mel Goldseip. She can come forward. What's going on here? Uh, hi, I'm Mel Goldsight, Precinct 20, Mass Ave, and I'm with the Arlington Human Rights Commission. I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you about our warrant article to expand equal protection to gender diverse people in our town. Equality is a long-standing value in Arlington. The creation of this commission over 20 years at, ago at town meeting is proof of that. You tasked us with advancing issues related to the fair and equal treatment of individuals and providing a mechanism for addressing complaints arising out of these issues. In addition to investigating official complaints, your mandate to us includes conducting needs assessments and presenting educational programs to increase mutual respect. Two examples of this work are our LGBT survey and a recent workshop on understanding gender diversity for representatives from town groups, including the Board of Selectmen, police, schools, library, Council on Aging, and Youth Health and Safety Coalition. This bylaw amendment is part of that same work. Article 18 will extend equality to the transgender and gender non-conforming community. These are the exact same protections from discrimination that the town already guarantees based on race, color, religious views, national origin, gender, citizenship, age, ancestry, family marital status, sexual orientation, disability, source of income, or military status. Non-discrimination laws protecting gender identity have already passed across the nation in 17 states D.C., and over 200 cities and towns. So far, a dozen communities here in Massachusetts have also added these protections, ranging from Boston and Cambridge to Lynn and Medford. We hope that Massachusetts state law will soon add gender identity protections for public spaces like medical offices, restaurants, libraries, public parks, and the T. That law is desperately needed because a recent survey found that 65% of transgender people in Massachusetts experienced discrimination in public spaces in the previous year. And 20% avoided necessary medical care because of prior mistreatment in healthcare settings. 
Support for the state bill finally seems to have reached a critical mass, but it's still not certain that it will pass this session. So it's crucial for communities like Arlington to create local laws to fill the gap. Even when the state law passes, it will still be important for Arlington's bylaws to fully reflect our town's values. The current wording of the non-discrimination bylaw makes explicit, to our com makes explicit our commitment to diversity and tells the specific groups that are most often victims of discrimination and violence that we care about their safety and well-being. We have already declared Arlington to be a welcoming community to so many. Article 18 is an important way to show our continued commitment to equality and diversity for all vulnerable groups. I'm so grateful and proud that our Board of Selectmen voted unanimously to support this warrant article. I hope you agree with them that it's time for Arlington to take a stand on the right side of history. Please pass this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else wish to speak to this article? Seeing none, we have before us a recommend the vote of the Board of Selectmen. Ms. Day. Herman? No, you're the other one. Lathwood. Mr. Lathwood, are you ready? New guy's getting used to it. He's used to easy framing him, not Arlington. This works. This doesn't work. There's no there's no data input. Well, I don't know if he figured it out yet. Well, maybe we'll do this one by voice. Get the next one ready. We have a force, a recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 18. It brings us to Article 19. We have a force, a recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen to state that the Human Rights Commission may have an executive director as opposed to shall. Someone wanted to speak to this. They took it off the consent agenda. Who wanted to speak to it? Hmm, nobody. All right, all in favor to recommend the vote of the Board of Selectmen to change the executive director from may to shall, please say yes. Yes. All opposed say no. It's a unanimous vote and I so declare it. We now have before us, that closes Article 19, brings us to Article 20. We have before us a recommended vote of the Human Rights Commission regarding chairpeople. They want to have two chairpersons. You guys ready on a vote yet? We're up to number 20. No, he can't figure it out. And he, someone took this one off the consent agenda too. Who wanted to talk to this one? If you take it off the consent agenda, you really should have something to say about it. Otherwise, you just delaying everybody's time. All right, all in favor of the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote and I so declare it. Thank you very much. That brings us to Article 22, the tree bylaw. Uh, Ms. Stamps, I think, wanted to speak to that. 21 was on the um, consent agenda that you passed. Yep, 22. Do you want to speak to this, Mahan? Ms. Mahan first? You'll next, next some stamps. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Diane Mahan, Chairman of the Board. I try not to get up when you have the Selectman's Report before you and just repeat everything back because I know you've read everything that's in here. I'm, when I do rise, it's when I feel I have something to add. On this particular Warren article, um, the Board of Selectmen um, had three meetings. Um, we started back in August, and then we had the proponents in Susan Stamps, who I believe is on the list to speak. Um, and when they came back the second time, um, 
the board, in uh, theory, agreed with uh, the spirit of the article before us, but we felt like the due diligence hadn't been done. We cited that similar to when we had snow plowing issues about you know cutting back corners and how that was done, a uh, member of the Board of Selectmen, myself, and the town manager met with the subcontractors, got feedback for them to find the best way to get it done. Then when we had um, leaf blower discussions, again, we did a similar thing. A member of the Board of Selectmen, again, didn't volunteer myself, and the town manager met with um, you know, the landscapers here in Arlington to get something that would work um, and, and basically talk to the people that we feel would be affected. At the second meeting when the um, members of the tree committee came before us, we didn't see that same due diligence. We had um, asked them previously, but perhaps not artfully so, and as much as we should, and we said, you know, we really need you to do similar to what we've done in the past, you know, talk to the end users, the Arlington developers, in terms of uh, what it is you're proposing. And the developers that I had spoken to all said, you know, we love trees, we're not, you know, anti-trees, or, you know, we want to save as much as we can. But the original Warren article that was before us was, for me, laden with a lot of roads that we could go down that I really think we shouldn't. So I said to the proponents, you know, you really need to do this due diligence and, you know, you need to come back when you've, you get it done, expecting that it would take them till maybe next year's town meeting. But lo and behold, two weeks later, um, Susan Stamps and Mary Ellen Arano, I'm gonna say the names wrong, and Sally McNair, I'm, and I'm probably saying them wrong. They went out and they spoke to Arlington developers. They made many, many changes from their suggestions. Uh, the end result was this was something that both sides agreed upon. Uh, when they came before the, the Board of Selectmen, I don't know how they got this Herculean task done um, in two weeks versus um, two months, but they did. They went out, and similar to other efforts that you know really have been at the forefront of Arlington, this is really the best way to get accomplished here. It would only affect trees in the setback as design, as uh, promulgated by our zoning bylaws here in Arlington, and um, it's, it's something that I really think it's an idea whose time has come and the time is right now because they really have done all the work. So I, I would urge all members of town meeting, especially after you hear the presentation from our representatives from the tree committee, to uh, join with the selectmen and vote positive action. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ms. Mahan. Ms. Stamps? Susan Stamps, um, <clears throat> Precinct 3, and I'd like to ask a co-chair of the Tree Committee, Mary Ellen Arano, to join me at the podium. She can come up. I think she's going to run the PowerPoint, I hope, because I don't know how to do it. So um, the purpose of Article 22, the Tree Preservation Bylaw, is to reduce the impact on the town's tree canopy of um, major development on private property. This does, um, and by major development, we mean demolition, building a new house, or adding an addition that uh, increases the um, size of the footprint 50% or more. <clears throat> this does not apply to um, if you want to go in your backyard and take a tree down. This only applies in major development, very important distinction. The, as Ms. Mahan so nicely said, the selectmen um, were, uh, they unanimously approved this bylaw. We not only did t uh, vet this through Arlington builders, um, but we also talked to builders in other towns that have similar bylaws, and we talked to them about what does it add to the process in terms of cost and time. Um, several of uh, communities in Massachusetts have these tree bylaws, um, including Lexington, Wellesley, Cambridge, Newton, and many other towns. <clears throat> um, also, in the last week or so, we've gone around and we've also gotten unanimous support from the Conservation Commission the Redevelopment Board and the Open Space Committee, and also the Arlington Land Trust and some other uh, town groups have endorsed this by law. Um, they think the time has come. The master plan that town meeting, 
Oh man, I gotta really speed up here, I can see. Um, the master plan last year that we all approved talked a lot about how trees are really important to Arlington. I don't think I need to explain that to you, but the whole point is to um, not, um, we, can't we can't prevent the removal of trees on during development, but what we will do is ask for each tree that's removed for a payment to be made into the tree fund or um, for the tree to be replaced on the property so there won't be a net loss in tree canopy, more or less. <clears throat> um, we became aware of this problem in town a year ago when residents started uh, coming to us um, worried about uh, clear cutting in their neighborhoods. Um, the trees were disappearing and they were um, started sending us pictures that were pretty alarming. Um, like this one um, near Spy Pond where just a, a whole huge swath of trees were, were gone. We knew the trees were very important to Arlington. Um, we couldn't help them, we couldn't do anything, and they said, well, you know, we, you need to do something. So we did a lot of research. We found out that other towns do regulate removal of trees during major development, and so that's why we put together this bylaw. Um, after all, Arlington is a tree city USA, which uh, requires a lot of diligence, commitment to trees. Um, in order to get that designation, we want to make sure we don't lose our tree canopy, which is dear to all the res residents. The open space and recreation plan that we um, approved, la that w was presented to us last year, also talked about the importance of trees, as did the master plan, which has trees all over it, about, and talks about how development needs to be in, in um, harmony with the natural habitat, and in fact, one of the recommendations is to look into uh, regulating removal of uh, trees on private property during development, but we realized last year that we needed to do more than look into it. We needed to do something as quickly as we could. Um, as Ms. Mahan said, we, um, at the end of the day, we did work with a lot of disparate groups, including um, the local builders, to come up with a really simple bylaw that everybody could comply with. Um, I found out that builders actually really love trees and um, they, they feel okay about having to um, compensate the town and the neighborhoods for trees that they remove. So it's a very simple, um, it's very simple that, have I gotten to that slide yet? Oh, what it does is the next one. I just totally lost my place here. Um, you okay, got two so minutes, to go to so the next better find slide. it. Yeah. Okay, so just to quickly go through the elements of the bylaw, um, again, it only applies in major development. Um, it only applies to protected trees, which are not all trees. They're um, um, trees that are large, mature trees. They're 10 inches in diameter, and they're healthy, um, and they're not in imminent danger of disease or insect infestation. And there are only trees in the setback. Now, probably the town meeting members have a pretty good idea now of what the setback of the property is. It's the, the frame around the inside of the property. It's 10 feet on the sides. It's 20 feet in the back. And it's 20 to 25 feet in the front. We're only talking about trees in the setback. Any tree that, um, so um, at the, uh, at the, before any site work, under this bylaw, before any site work can be done, the, um, uh, the builder has to submit a site plan that's the same one that they have uh, uh, done for their building permit. Um, it's just that they have the surveyor put the protected trees on the site plan. They take that to the tree warden and they say, these are the ones I want to remove, and then they pay their money, $500 per tree, or they have an obligation to uh, replace a tree on the property. Okay, so um, I think um, that pretty much sums it up. There's, um, there are, there's an issue, there's um, fines if they ignore the bylaw and they just go in and they do work without getting permission. I'm not gonna go into the details because I think that town council has some changes anyway um, to make this consistent with state law. But just to sum up, we love trees in Arlington. They give us lots of benefits and we hope you'll vote yes on article 22. Thank you very much. Mr. Heim.
Mr. Heim has two technical corrections he has to make to this. Good evening, Doug Heim, Town Council. Uh, these folks have done uh, really tremendous and very thorough work on this. I have to apologize for this uh, technical amendment. It was something that I caught rather late, in part due to the fact that there's a different set of general laws for fees for removal of public shade trees. But in any event, under Article 22, Section 5, Enforcement and Fines, A1 and 2, uh, there's a cap on the fine that the town can assess under uh, Chapter 40. So A2 should read five, uh, $300 instead of $500. And a one should read three hundred dollars per day of work rather than fifteen hundred dollars. Thank you. So you'll see in five a two, instead of five hundred, it should say three hundred. And in five a one, it should say three hundred dollars per day of work instead of fifteen hundred dollars. And my apologies to the tree committee for uh, not raising that, uh, for not catching that until now. Thank you. Okay, if you can all follow those two changes in section 5A1 and 2, we are going to make them administratively so that it's in conformance with state law. Did y'all follow what he did? Anybody didn't? Okay. No. Who? So in section 5A1, on the second line where it says section 4D, $1,500, we're crossing out $1,500 and we're inserting in its place $300 per day. That apparently is what state law allows. And in section 5A2, we're crossing out $500 and reducing that to $300. Is that now clear? Okay. Mr. Trem, um, um, Tib Tibbets. Hi, I'm Gary Tibbetts, uh, Precinct 5, and I'm here to ask you to support this bill. Um, I'm usually against government reaching into our private land and stuff like that, but this is an important bill. The tree canopy is important. Um, the tree committee, Susan Stamps, Ed Trembley, and, uh, came to me dur during the winter to ask advice from the landscape industry. I'm a landscape contractor. And uh, I gave them some. Uh, they took a lot of it, and some of it's in this bill. Um, you know, the, the tree canopy, canopy um, I've been doing this work all my life, full time for almost 40 years now. And uh, we worked on a job about 20 years ago down in Braintree. And it was in the uh, site of a former rock quarry. And they were building condominiums right near the Weymouth a a uh, Naval Air Station. And there were no trees anywhere. And that place you baked in. Um, I tan all the time. I got sunburns down there because there were, there were no trees. My kids used to call it the rock when I was working down there. We were there for two years. It was a big job. And um, I went back about eight or ten years later when the trees that had gotten planted, you know, started to mature and come about. And it was, a, it was just a totally different um, picture and a totally different environment. So, I, you know, this, this in most cases, um, this definitely only pertains to the setbacks, which you can't build in anyway. Um, and in most cases, the developers or homeowners, when they're, when they're doing a big thing, they're going to re-landscape anyway, and they're going to plant a couple of trees. It doesn't cost them anything. Um, and, uh, you know, the money that is turned in on the ones that don't get replanted, the town can plant them, whether they're street trees or parks or whatever. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll keep the canopy going. Um, the only adjustment I need, and I hate to throw another one into the mix, but I had talked to John Leone earlier today. Um, it requires that the tree be replanted within 90 days of the permit of occupancy being um, issued. And that, from an industry point, is unattainable. If you, a lot of people, if they're doing an addition to something, anybody that's remodeled their house knows, sometimes you... You know, you start it in the fall and you do it and you rush it to get it done for the holidays. Well, if you get your permit of occupancy December 15th, you can't plant a tree for three or four months, probably four or five months. Number one, the ground is usually frozen. Number two, the trees aren't available. And um, 
So I asked that it be changed to 180 days. And uh, Mr. Leone had said that could probably be done administratively, that we didn't need to put out a pamphlet. So with that change being made, I request that you, you know, um, approve this. I think it's a good article. Thank you. Do you have that in writing, sir? No, I don't. Up here. Come up and make sure this says what you want to say. So Mr. Mr. Tibbetts is proposing on section 4C, first line, replacing 90 days with 180 days. Um, Mr. Berkowitz. Thanks, Mr. Moderator. Bill Berkowitz, Precinct 8. I'm in support as well. Thank you. Since there is, seems to be pretty clear support for this uh, article in, in the House, I'll skip my, most of my speech. But simply to say that uh, because yesterday was a uh, rather gray and rainy uh, Sunday, I had the time to look up some research on trees, which I didn't know before. Found a couple of things that um, might guide not just our vote on this article, but also on future articles that might relate to trees and tree protection in the town. Uh, it's not just the uh, protecting against climate change by trapping pollutants or the absorption of carbon dioxide or uh, <clears throat> the health effects of, of uh, preventing respiratory disease. Uh, but two other points that uh, struck me I didn't know before, one, one being that uh, people who live on, according to a large scale study in Toronto in this case, um, people who live on streets with a number of street trees, uh, literally, according to the study, uh, feel uh, younger. <clears throat> um, their self-perceptions are uh, <clears throat> the more youthful. Um, Another study deals with a more, perhaps more salient issue for us having to do with m <clears throat> money uh, and studies of trees and, and property values, this one taking place in Portland, Oregon, where the researchers measured the uh, uh, property values uh, as a function in relation to street trees and found several things. One is that, uh, number one, the homes uh, in areas with street trees sold faster. Second, that the average increase in property sale values according to the study was in the vicinity of $7,000. Uh, but that this extended not only to the, the house where street trees were planted in front of, but also to neighbors' houses uh, within as far as 100 feet of the house with street trees, that that increased their property values as well. According to the researchers of this study, this indicated uh, figuratively, if not literally, that money can grow on trees. <clears throat> uh, uh, so I, I will hope that uh, we can take this into account, not just for this article, but for future articles that may come up before the meeting that regard trees and the role of trees in, <clears throat> in the community uh, and their protection. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berkowitz. Um, this gentleman over here. Yep. Thank you. I'm a, a new town member, uh, Daniel Jalkett from Precinct 6. I don't have a lot to say on this, except I do support it. I, um, I'm also, uh, would just like to say, I think it's admirable that two sides that might have been combative about an issue like this were able to come together and compromise on something. And personally, I might like to see something that went further, but I'm much happier to see something that stands a good chance of passing. So I think that's something that both sides should feel good about and not feel like they've given up too much, but we're getting hopefully get something good out of it. Uh, the main reason I rose today, Mr. Moderator, was I heard something in the, um, in the uh, modification with, the, with respect to um, the town councils. Yes. Um, I, just, I don't know if this is important or not, but I just want to point it out now so that I don't regret not saying anything if it is, which is I recall the town council saying the amendment for the $1,500 figure was to change it and, and to replace $300 per day of work. And then when you restated it for the, um, for the meeting, I believe you said $300 per day. 
And that sounds like it could be a tricky distinction, uh, especially if it's not clear what we are amending. Uh, he's actually given it to me in writing now, and it is $300 per day of work. Okay. I, I misunderstood him as well. So it's $300 per day. What does that mean? Weekday? Five days a week? Mr. Heim? Work day? Hmm? Oh, any day that they're working. Okay. So it's any day that they're actually working without a tree plant. Okay. So I'm satisfied with that. And I don't know if there's anything else that needs to happen to make that official, but um, I'm glad to also have my first chance to speak to you. So thank you. Ms. Mamon? Serene Amendment, Precinct 21. I think this is great. I, I really enjoy the preservation of trees. I think there's some towns like Burlington. I know my sister lives there, and they said that they have to have 50% of the trees per business area and so forth. They have some odd rule that seemed pretty sensible. My concern is uh, it says protected trees are 10 inches or greater. Um, in my neighborhood, there's a lot of Norwegian maples, and I wish they were added um, uh, not on the protected list because in my yard, we have at least 10 in the backyard that I was hoping to remove to or adjust somehow to make a little sitting area. Um, so I think I have some um, just I think it should be at enhanced a little bit, and that's that's my only point. Otherwise, I'm I'm happy I'm happy with this. Maybe Susan can comment on that. That's. Do you have an actual question? Yeah. What are, uh, is there? Did they, did they consider um, specific species of trees um, in this consideration? Ms. Stamps. Yeah, we we thought a lot about invasive species, and the problem is that. <clears throat> Uh, invasive species do make for good tree canopy in many cases, like you take the Norway maple is a, a 50 to 55 percent of Arlington's tree canopy, so I don't think we're going to want to get rid of those. And, uh, you know, we, we tried to pick winners and losers, and we just gave up. It was, you know, it's really about the tree canopy. It's not about controlling invasives. That's the, the, the I think the tree department does have a program for trying to gradually over time replace invasive species with um, healthy native species and that's about, that's, okay, that's what you're so gonna get. That, that's what I wanted to know. So is there a program for uh, replacing these trees? So what would be other trees that you would consider? Um, could you give me some examples of the native trees? I, I really, I, okay. I, I, yeah. That's fine, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Schlickman. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, motion to terminate debate on all items under this article. We have motion to terminate debate on, and it's been seconded. Let's do, a, uh, let's do this motion to terminate debate by clicker. You guys ready over there? <laughs> okay, we're going to have a motion to terminate debate as soon as the light goes on. One, yes to terminate. Two, no, you do not want to terminate. Okay, one yes to terminate, two no to continue debating. One yes, two no. <laughs> Sir. Did it reset? Oh. No. Yeah, because there's only 121 people voting. There's more than 121 of you here. We're all set to go again? All right. Because we're going to do the amendment and the regular vote with these things, so figure it out. Okay, go ahead. One yes, two no.
The vote is terminated, 194 in the affirmative, 10 in the negative. Okay, so votes terminate, debates terminated. We now have before us <clears throat> Mr. Tibbetts' um, amendment. He wants to amend Section 4C to delete 90 and insert in its place 180. So he wants to give the folks 180 days to replant the trees instead of 90. All in favor of Mr. Tibbetts' amendment, please vote one yes, two no, as soon as we're ready. This would be a majority vote. No lights, because he hasn't given us the high sign yet. I know, but we have to get it ready for the regular votes. We're testing them now. Yes, it is. Yeah, <laughs> we'll give him ten more seconds. Okay, here we go. This is for Mr. Tibbetts' amendment, 90 to 180. Please, one yes, two no. Two hundred and three in the affirmative, five in the negative. It is so amended. Two, oh, three, two, five. We now have before us a recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen as amended. All in favor, please press one as soon as we get the high sign for yes, two for no. Yes, sir. No, we're going to do that administratively because that's state law. And that is the most state law allows, I believe, so we're just going to go with that. Otherwise, the AG would turn us down all entirely on the bylaw. So we don't really have a choice on that one. So as soon as you guys are ready, all right, one for yes, two for no. It's an affirmative vote, 200 in the affirmative, 9 in the negative. It's a vote, and I so declare it. Passed. 200 to 9. That's a vote on Article 22. That brings us to Article 23. Electronic distribution of notices and materials. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to speak to this for one second. Early this... Uh, Late last year, Madam Clerk asked me if there was a way she could distribute to us all those various notices we get, um, that you've been elected, you're up for re-election, town meeting's going to start here and then, electronically. There's nothing in our bylaws that approve it, so uh, with some of her help and mine and the town meeting procedure committee, we came up with a bylaw that is modeled upon some other towns that will allow us, if and only if you opt in, meaning we're going to have a letter either sent around probably after town meeting for next year that you will have to affirmatively opt in to receive your notifications electronically. Um, I've spoken with Ms. Kropelka in the selectmen's um, office as well. They are in favor of this. If you opt in, you can also poss possibly, we're working on it, get all of your reports electronically too. So if you have a device like Mr. Schlickman's playing with right now, you will be able to get all of your um, Warren articles, recommended votes, and everything right on your um, tablet so you can, we can dispense with a lot of this paper. That, but only if you want to. This would be the enabling legislation that allows us to let you opt in to do that. If you don't opt in, you're going to get paper. Um, Mr. Wagner, then Mr. Um, Helmuth. 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. I want to say I uh, think that there is not a problem here, but um, I was a new member a long time ago, and I applaud brava to those that uh, are trying to make the situation with the paper better. We can save trees, we can talk about it too, but particularly we should find some way to distribute things and then in this room, as we're trying to figure out what the heck we're talking about, we should find a way to, to index, to go more quickly to the actual comments. So I, I thank you to that. Thank you. Mr. Helmuth? Eric Helmuth, Precinct 12. Uh, I support this uh, as well, which won't surprise any of you, I think. Uh, one thing that just caught my ear when, when the moderator was explaining this was uh, the idea that one of the items that could be sent out electronically would be our notice of uh, re, uh, putting in our re-election papers. And it occurred to me that because I send emails for a living, uh, sometimes emails don't make it through. They get trapped in spam filters or a, an adverse Gmail inbox tab. Um, so. I don't know that I even have a specific question. It's just something that I would suggest to people implementing this is to think about uh, something like that where if you don't return it, you're not on the ballot, that there be some kind of a backup or a fail-safe uh, mechanism. Maybe it's just a phone call um, or something like that just because, although email is extremely convenient, for certain really important documents like that. You know, I'd hate it if, if um, I missed that j because of a technological problem or just email flood and um, missed my chance. Technological problems? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Does anyone else wish to speak to this article? Okay, um, you guys ready? <coughs> Sir, oh, go ahead. Revolt Precinct 9, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, on page 10 of the Selectman's Report, the last uh, paragraph says that written confirmation shall require provision of an email address. Town meeting members may opt out at any time by written notice to the town clerk. But their comment and your remarks indicate that. Uh, that officials can have to opt in. So which is it, opt out or opt in? In. If you want to get electronically, you have to affirmatively so do something. But the comment is different from the, from the actual uh, section Oh, that's 12. if you are already opted in and you want to get out later on, you can. You're not bound but forever. That said that it requires that you provide an email and you, then if you don't want that, then you can opt out by written notice to the town clerk. That's a lot different than everybody, than having to say, than having to say you want to opt in. That's a huge distinction, and I'd like to, that clarification no, see, on that. The very first line, um, town meeting members may, <coughs> by written confirmation, elect to receive electronic copies. Once you have done that, you're receiving okay, electronic I'm so copies. I'm sorry. I yeah. was looking at the last paragraph yeah, that's that indicated that you had to opt out. Yeah, that's if you don't want to get them electronically okay. anymore. Well, I don't. Okay. <laughs> I'm old school. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Oster, did you have something to say? Ma'am? Go ahead. Molly Flukiger, Precinct 4. Um, as we're talking about best practices for electronic distribution, I would also encourage to make sure that all the formats are uh, ADA compliant and accessible so that we aren't alienating um, any access to documents as we implement this. Okay, thank you. Sir. Daniel Jalf at Precinct 6. I like the idea of this because I live mostly paperlessly myself. A um, couple of things that just don't seem clear to me. I guess I have questions um, for the moderator, probably, Mr. Moderator. Um, is there any um, kind of tacit understanding that the email documents would be identical to the documents that you might otherwise receive by paper? I'm thinking specifically of um, 
documents with diagrams or like rich graphics, and sometimes these things get converted in a way that um, might not be compatible with everybody's applications they have. For instance, I, for instance, don't have Microsoft Word. Would there be any kind of like standard by which people would be expected to deliver these? It'd probably by, be by, um, <clears throat> excuse me, PDF. Okay, PDF sounds good to me, personally. Um, yes. The other thing that I was confused with by reading this um, was it was sort of unclear to me whether it would apply to, and it sounds like it's intended to eventually sort of apply to things like substitute motions, um, it's kind of the stuff we get on our seats now. Um, what kind of thinking, if any, has gone into the uh, question of like, I, I, I'm envisioning like a scenario where say 75% of us are enrolled for electronic distribution and so people know they only have to bring 25% worth of paper documents, and then some of us who are in, enrolled for electronic distribution go ahead and grab a document anyway. It's kind of a nice, I don't like wasting all this paper, but it's kind of a nice system now if it's as I assume it is, everybody just kind of has to bring enough for everybody. As far as our thinking has gone so far, it's for those initial notices and um, in consultation with Mary Ann Sullivan, she may be able to do all of the reports of committees, the finance committee report, the selectmen's report. Just as if you ever look at the selectmen's agendas, you'll be able to scroll right through every, all of the paperwork they get using that same system. Mm -hmm. that I've had initial discussions with her regarding that, but I can't promise yeah. that's gonna happen because we don't have any control over what they do or it, budgeting for that. But that's where we're heading, hopefully. So, sort of just to understand what As far what as I, amendments go, yeah, yeah, they're going to have to still put those until we have 100% buy-in. I guess my concern is basically that I won't vote for something now that I'll end up feeling like I regretted because it put um, town meeting members in a situation where they weren't being informed. So, out of curiosity, as far as legally, as far as this goes legally, um, what kind of process would there have to be gone through after this bylaw is passed to say refine the rules like let's say somebody decided um, that 10 percent of town meeting members can't read pdfs i guess they would be advised to go back to paper or something but um i guess i'm just kind of curious what are we getting into legally if we pass this it sounds like it's a great advisory thing it's, but it's, is, is, is the is the way that the law the law the bylaw is written is it kind of advisory in that, or is it a permission to It's do permission something? to start the process. Okay, that and sounds. And permission to start um, collecting people to opt into it. But we're going to go baby steps here until we know it works. We're not gonna take away paper until such time as nobody wants paper anymore. So it's, okay. it's the first step yeah. down the road. I really like the idea of getting rid of all those big stacks of paper, so I would support this. Thank you. Okay. Woman over here next to Mr. Kleiman, and then you, sir. Marion King, Precinct 1. Um, although I really enjoy uh, reading a lot of things online, um, one thing I would find difficult about this is when arriving at town meeting and needing to resource back to check up on data, it would mean that we would all have to bring our electronics with us in order to be able to do that. And, um, being a low-income person, my, I do have a laptop, but it's huge. It's really not meant to be something you carry around. It's kind of a keep-it-in-one-place kind of laptop. And um, I, I would find it really difficult to keep up with things if it was my only source. So though it would be nice to be able to, you know, read the PDF. I don't see it as something that would be able to replace the papers. And my other big concern is the mailing out of um, uh, your renewal to be uh, a town meeting member in which that paperwork does need to be returned by a certain date to get on the ballot. 
um, I think that would be a really easy thing to miss if that particular paperwork were not mailed out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the gentleman to your right first, then Mr. Cook, then this gentleman over here. Mr. Cook. That's not Mr. Cook. Steve Liggett, Precinct 9. Um, I support this. I think it's a great idea. I want to join those who are offering suggestions upon implementation that uh, I think it would be really, really helpful to add a version identifier on every copy. And I say that, uh, I rose to say, it, you'll figure that out, but I wanted to communicate it to everybody here as well because I know that when I was trying to sift through the seven copies of various different amendments that didn't have a date, didn't have a ver version number. I picked them up at different locations. One was on my chair, one I found outside, one I'd gotten at an information session. I had no idea which one we were actually voting on. So a suggestion generally for all of us, if we could put some sort of an identifier so that we have a clue which one we're focused on. Thanks. Good idea, thank you. Yep. Ed Sharp. Yeah. That's it, Mr. Sharp. Ted Sharp, Precinct 7. I, I think that the, uh, that the burden of uh, opting out electronically once you've opted in is sounds sort of like corporate and, and burdensome. Uh, I, I would suggest, and I'm going to vote for it in its current form. I'm not going to try to amend this on the floor. It's a reasonable suggestion. But I would suggest that the implement, again, another implementation suggestion, I would suggest that the implementers decide that if they get a bounce or two, they ought to opt you out automatically, just as a courtesy. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Moderator, uh, Greg Christiana, Precinct 15. Anyone knows me, I could talk about this topic at great length, but I will surprise you by motioning to terminate debate. No. Oh, to, oh, oh, no, you didn't say, you said more than the oh, magic words. Sorry. All you can say when you want to terminate is motion to terminate debate on the matter and all, on the article and all matters under it. More than those magic words, we can't do it. Is it, is it too late? So for maybe that? the next person up will do it. Okay. My apologies, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Good try, though. <laughs> now you know the magic words. Ms. Mamone, I think they want to terminate the bay. <laughs> Serena Memon, um, Precinct 21. I wish to terminate this article, or debate on this article on all matters related to it. Okay. All in favor of terminating the debate, please say yes. 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 Opposed? It's, oh, it's not a unanimous vote. Debate is terminated, and I so declare it. We have now before us a recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen. Ready? Go ahead and vote. One yes to approve, two no to done. All in favor of vote, one yes, two opposed, no. <coughs> Two hundred and two in the affirmative, seven in the negative. It's a positive vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article Twenty Three, and brings us to Article Twenty Six. My name is Elizabeth. Oh, Clark. you are not recognized. You just don't get up. You can sit, sit, sit. <laughs> we have before us a recommended vote of no action. Do I see anybody who wants to make a substitute? Ms. Pyle. Thank you. Clearly I'm new here. 
My name is Elizabeth Pyle, and I am a town meeting member from Precinct 10. I move that the recommended vote on Article 26 be substituted with the motion that has been previously distributed in hard copy to all town meeting members. And I'd like to introduce Christopher Loretti, who is a Arlington resident, to speak on this matter. Thank you. Mr. Loretti. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street. Article 26 asks the town manager to provide individual town email addresses to members of five main boards and commissions, or about 40 people. It also gives him the option of including other board members if those boards are subject to the public records law. And the reason I put that in is during the um, warrant article, or the hearing before the Board of Selectmen, the town manager indicated that he supports these board members using town email addresses, and in fact suggested there were several other boards that he would also like, like to have the members um, uh, included. Now, some people have asked whether this applies to town meeting members, and the answer is no. It doesn't because town meeting members are not subject to the public records law, and the town manager uh, suggested he didn't want to include them and would re prefer to start small should this ar article pass. Now, there are several reasons for supporting this. And the first is that it provides better access to members of these boards, both by members of the public and by town employees. Just this weekend, I tried to email all of the members of the Arlington Redevelopment Board but I didn't know the email address of the newest member. I only knew his name. I couldn't, so I couldn't send him the email. I had to ask the planning director to do so. And while she was more than happy to do that for me, she really, that's not her job, and she really shouldn't be bothered doing that sort of thing. The other reason for supporting this is it's important to keep in mind that members of all of these boards are municipal employees. They're subject to the open meeting law. They're subject to the public records law. Their emails are public records under that law. And the state um, has very complex and comprehensive requirements about how municipal employees are to maintain their public records. I distributed electronically the guidance from the town of Stowe. And if you looked at that at all, you saw how just how extensive it is and what the requirements were for emails. And it's not just the body of an email, it's the address information, it's the metadata information that becomes a public record and has to be retained for five years or more in some cases. And I would suggest that it's a real challenge when you have volunteer boards using their own personal email addresses to be in full compliance with, with those record retention requirements. People change their email accounts, they change their internet service providers, their terms of office expire, they move away. And I, I, I would really ask you, if you think that you asked for an email from a, a, one of these board members from five or years ago, do you really think you'd get it? Um, so I think the compliance is much easier with the town managing the process with its own email service, and, and there would be no need to, to segregate personal emails from town business emails in that case because all of the town business related emails would already be on the town server. I would also point out that this um, practice of using the town email addresses has been identified as a best practice by the state supervisor of records, and he's the person responsible for, um, for implementing and enforcing the state's uh, public records law. I also suggest that it makes it much easier for, public rec for town officials covered by, this, um, you know, covered by this vote to comply with the public records law. I had a case this past, um, fall where I requested emails from the Finance Committee and the Board of Selectmen related to lobbying in the state against updating the state's public records law. And it, frankly, it involved a lot of energy and a lot of time by the people on those boards that sh really shouldn't have been required. I think I had to ask four times from the Selectmen to get everything I wanted. I did get the emails, um, well there weren't any, but I did get a response from the Finance Committee, but then the, the Secretary or someone on the committee had to contact each member of the board individually to find out you know, what emails existed or didn't exist that, met the, um, that were applicable to the, um, to the request. Had they been using town email addresses, this all could have been done by an administrative employee within the town government, and none of these people would have had, would have had to have been involved. It would, it would have made things much easier for everyone. A few things the town meeting should know. Uh, as I mentioned, the town manager supports these board members using town email accounts, but he recognizes he can't force them to do so. And that's why there's a couple parts to this vote that say it's too, um, if 
the board members are provided town email addresses, the, the in town employees will send email documents and correspondence to them at the town address, and only those addresses will be listed on the town website. But it does not force anyone to use email at all. So if there are members of these boards who are not, um, or people who just don't like email, this does not force them to use it. I'd like to address a few comments in the selectmen's report. Uh, one, this is not a bylaw change. Arlington's Town Manager Act allows town meetings to make requests of the town manager, and that's all that you would be doing by voting on this article. Um, cost is not an issue mentioned in the report because the Director of Information Technology at the Selectman's hearing indicated this is not a big deal. The town already provides thousands of email addresses. We're only talking about 40 more. And while I recognize this does place a small burden on the affected um, members of the, these boards and commissions, I think that's a responsibility that comes with holding public office. And I would point out that I did a quick search of other selectmen in other towns in, uh, throughout the Commonwealth and quite quickly came up with more than 150 who are using individual town email addresses. I would suggest that the board members affected by this vote are at least as technologically savvy as those people are. And I would just ask you to support this for several reasons. First, it's good government. And I would ask you also to support the town manager. I would also ask you to support the volunteers who serve on these boards because I really believe it makes it easier for them. And finally, I think by supporting this, you'll be helping ensure that the town complies with the public records law. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Schluckman. Paul Schluckman, Precinct 9, member of the school committee, and I guess I'd be covered under this resolution. So I'd like to ask first the town manager. He, he has been cited on his opinion. I'd like to hear his opinion firsthand. Mr. Chapdelaine, do you have an opinion? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, yeah, I, I do have an opinion. Um, certainly from a public records point of view, having control over the records uh, does make responding to public records requests uh, more um, more efficient and, and easier to do. Uh, however, I, I do also understand the desire of long-serving board and committee members who have accounts, some that have AOL.com accounts, so that you know signifies how long they've been using those personal accounts, not wanting to manage multiple, um, multiple email addresses. That said, uh, I've talked about this with the chief technology officer, town council, uh, and I, I think if the, if the meeting was to vote favorably on this, what we could do is uh, set up uh, email addresses for all of the members that are outlined here, uh, put them on the website, uh, and then if the board members and committee members that were affected uh, would like us to, we could forward any emails sent to those accounts to their personal accounts so they wouldn't have to manage multiple email addresses, and then request, and again, we couldn't mandate they do, the, uh, mandate they do this, but request that when they are sending any town-related emails or responding, that they simply copy their town account so that it is archived um, in that fashion. So. Uh, again, we, we cannot force any uh, member of a public body to do this, but I think from a technical point of view, we can administer it. Okay. Uh, I have another question, and I'm perhaps uh, more appropriate for town council, but I'll ask the moderator. If somebody were to hypothetically send me an email asking me if my opinion on, say, a ballot question that would be in June, from my, un my understanding is that I'm prohibited from using town resources to promote a vote either way on a ballot question or for any political purposes. What would happen if I were to respond to that with my opinion on a ballot question using a town email address? Mr. Heim? Doug Heim, town council, that's quite a question. Um, I think that what the uh, Office of Campaign Finance would likely say is that uh, elected officials in particular are afforded more mm -hmm. latitude mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and are allowed to express their opinion. If your email address was used to distribute mm -hmm. a uh, opinion, essentially as a means of conveying your position on a ballot question, it could be an issue. Um, Responding to a question, I think it would probably be on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that they'd find a violation. I'm sort of on the spot on this one, mm -hmm. but I think that the real key would be, are you using something that's um, a town resource to basically broadcast a position mm -hmm. 
and there, there is some potential for uh, liability there. Uh, I would just like to uh, point out to the esteemed moderator that uh, proposed votes are on my iPad, and I'm using that, as just as many of us are, for electronic devices. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I am somewhat internet savvy, and I do handle multiple email addresses. I guess I can handle another email address, switching back and forth uh, when I need to say something as Paul Schlickman person or voter even when I'm lobbying on an education issue, not as a school committee member, but as a voter, which is my First Amendment right. Um, I, you'd have to go back and forth between addresses and check and make sure that you're sending it from the right address. And sometimes I make a mistake and don't send things out from the email address I intended to. Um, so I would hope that people would have some grace for us if this is adopted. Uh, that we, we're not strictly enforcing all the rules here and looking to play gotcha with the elected officials. That said, I, I feel compelled to abide by the decision of this meeting, uh, so I will be abstaining from this vote to allow the rest of the meeting to make the decision. Thank you. Ms. LaCourt. Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15, and it's relevant at the moment that I'm a former member of the Board of Selectmen. I think I have about 15 email addresses. Um, there's treasurer at aefma.org, there's Annie at Exponent Partners, there's Annie at LaCourt.net. There's a couple new ones this week. Um, Almost all of those email addresses forward to my main email address and I'm able to tell the source of my email and I'm able to respond appropriately. I also happen to be in possession of a very old email file that contains probably five or 6,000 emails that all relate to business um, that I undertook for the town when I was a member of the Board of Selectmen that the town is not in possession of. So I hate to say it, but I think this is a really good idea and long overdue. Thank you. Gentleman over here in the middle, back, pass. Mr. Jameson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. Um, so first off, is this a resolution? It certainly sounds like one. Can someone please determine this is something we're asking to be done versus telling? It's, a, oh, do you have an answer to that, Mr. Loretti? I think it's more of a request. No, can I read the section of the town manager act? That, uh, N no, it's just, it's a, is it a, it's a simple question. Request? Resolution, vote. yes or no? Doug Heim, Town Council. It's not a resolution. It's a directive under the Town Manager Act, sector, Section 15J. Are we able to tell the manager how high to jump? I thought we couldn't. You can't tell the manager how high to jump necessarily, but with respect to this type of uh, directive, you can make a request uh, to the town manager. It's, this is likely something that's within the town meeting's power. Okay. Um, and, and so for those of you who are new to this, this is, uh, re relates to the open meeting law in the state of Massachusetts. Um, the, the previous, the, the proponent of this listed uh, employees. Well, um, I'm on the recycling committee and I have to obey by open meeting law and reports and minutes and all those things and I am not an employee. I am a volunteer. I believe, um, although the FinCon members get pittance and 50 bucks a year, uh, they're basically volunteers, as are the redevelopment board. And the school committee does not get paid. The board of selectmen do, but uh, the amount of money they get for what they do, we're basically all a bunch of volunteers. Um, we are characterized by state law as being, quote unquote, employees of the town. Um, I thank the manager for his thoughts. Um, it, the last line says, no meeting, no member of a public body. Clarifications, public body uh, uh, relate to all of the uh, boards listed or just to the other public bodies uh, alluded to in the uh, proposed article? 
Is there a question? What did you mean by yeah, that? Yeah, the question is, in the last line, it says, no member of a public body affected by this vote shall be required to use email to conduct town business. What does that relate to? The other public bodies alluded to in the article, in the motion, or the listed uh, boards and committees? It refers to any public body affected by the vote, so either the one specifically listed or any that the town manager may deem appropriate. Does the town council consider that to be clear language? That last sentence I take to mean you're not required to use email. If you want to use snail mail, you can. Okay. That's how I interpret that last language. Um, I'm going to leave you all up to this. Bye. <laughs> Mr. Rocha? I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Do you want to talk? Yeah. Michelle DeRocher, Precinct 19. I just wanted to add a couple notes, one of which was about efficiencies. Um, as a former member of the Conservation Commission, I'm aware that at times, just to conduct some of the business of the board, very large files would need to be sent to board members. and. This would be a way to ensure that some of the boards in town have some necessary support to work efficiently. I can imagine the redevelopment board would have uh, massive plans that they're occasionally reviewing. And so this may really help them. Also, as a metadata librarian professionally, um, I work with colleagues who do text mining. And that ability would drastically uh, improve efficiency when trying to comply with um, requests for information. And so in terms of cost savings, I think this would be a real benefit to the town. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Maher? John Mark, Precinct 14. Uh, I think some of the comments in the Selectman's report bear emphasizing, and I, I know you all have it in front of you, but uh, this town is one of the great uh, qualities of it is its uh, volunteers. Uh, and my suggestion to you is that requiring this of all volunteers boards would be a recipe for disaster and would, in fact, uh, inhibit uh, volunteers from uh, uh, agreeing to serve. Uh, parsing out what uh, social comments between and official comments and various emails. We all have, uh, at least I have a number of email accounts. And uh, I suggest to you that uh, this is, is not a workable solution. I also suggest to you, I, I'm also delighted to say that Doug Heim is the town council and I'm not. But in my, <clears throat> but in my considered uh, opinion, based upon my experience and my understanding of the general laws, uh, this can't be enacted unless it's by a bylaw. A resolution will not do it. So uh, I think it is, as I say, very confusing, uh, not going to uh, affect uh, the <clears throat> what's intended here. Uh, we have an open meeting law. We have a public records law. There are uh, recourses under those for uh, violations and securing uh, matters that are within the ambit of the law. And uh, emails are certainly uh, qualified. <clears throat> so I think uh, that would not uh, uh, be advantageous for the town, and uh, as I say, I think it would be a recipe for disaster, and I urge you uh, not to support the uh, substitute motion. Okay, we're going to take one more, Ms. Mamone, then we're going to go to break. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Serena Memon, Precinct 21. Mr. Moderator, I just want to clarify my name is Memon, not Mimon. Memon? Just, yes. Memon. Yes, thank you. All right, um, going on to this uh, substitute motion, I feel that this is an important topic, um, considering what's happening in politics right now with Hillary Clinton with uh, using her personal emails versus uh, the State Department's emails for you know, the uh, country's uh, business. So I think uh, for certain selected people, as noted here, as well as I'm not so sure uh, 
town manager may deem. I'm not too sure about that language, but I think it's appropriate. It'll give us accountability, transitions, efficiency, as somebody mentioned, as well as no repeat of labor. If somebody has takes over the selectman position, that they can investigate this, um, the interactions uh, in a much more efficient manner rather than bugging the previous selectman and so forth. So that being, say, I'm, uh, being said, I am in support of this wholly. Um, second thing I want to point out is um, in the fifth, cent, fifth line, it says pubic records, not public records. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if this gets voted through, we'll make that administrative change. <laughs> That'll give us a nice entertainment for the break, I guess. All right, thanks. We're going to make that change administratively right now. Thank you very much. We're going to go to break. Uh, come back in seven minutes. We're going to start with Mr. Tully. <laughs> Essence of this article is good government, and that was alluded to earlier, I would second that sentiment. I think there tends to be sort of this reaction that any time we try to improve something, there's the connotation that somebody's doing something wrong, and I don't think that's the case. I don't think anyone's suggesting that any of these town boards are not honest, they're not trustworthy people, that they're doing anything improper. But any time we have the opportunity to improve something, I think we ought to take that opportunity. So. I have a lot of respect for the, the folks that serve on these town boards, but I would say that having read the selectman's comment, to be perfectly frank, I, I found some of, the com some of the opposition a little bit weak. Um, I've stood here before and I've told you I'm not that smart a guy, and if I can figure out how to have two screens up on my desk at work, one with my work email and one with my personal Yahoo email, I'm certain that any of these other folks can, can figure it out. It's just not that difficult. Uh, it also doesn't create any more work for anybody. There, there seemed to be this implication from some of the other speakers that all these good volunteers, and I don't say that uh, sarcastically, but all the good folks that volunteer so much time and effort on behalf of our town would somehow be burdened by this. It doesn't create any more work for you. It just requires you to send and receive your email from a different email account. If you're going to be emailing anyway, it's the same amount of work. It, it's not a nuisance. And I think a lot of these contrived arguments that we've been hearing against this are really um, simply an effort to try to crowbar the square peg into a round hole because there's this resistance to change. Um, I would also say that with respect to the comment that we do already have public records laws, we do. But in fact, I know that Mr. Loretti and I know that myself and I'm sure many others have had our own frustrations at times trying to make requests under those public records laws. You don't need to do anything more than probably uh, Google some news stories about them. It, it's been written about extensively. Uh, the mere fact that we have these public records laws doesn't necessarily mean that people are complying with them. So anything that we can do to make, make, the, uh, make public records access more streamlined make government more transparent and improve upon uh, government, even an already good government, I think we ought to take that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dennis? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Greg Dennis, Precinct 1. Um, I'm very sympathetic to this motion, but I think I'll be ultimately voting against it. Um, I consider myself a proponent of open and transparent government. I recently lobbied the state legislature. Yep. Oh, sorry about that. Now I can hear my echo. Um, I consider myself a proponent in open and transparent government, and I lobbied, recently lobbied our state legislature in favor of the public records law um, that's currently sitting before the legislature. Um, so I like of the idea of doing something here. Um, where I find fault with it is that I feel it conflates a particular policy goal, a good policy, a laudable policy goal, which is email record retention, with a specific technical solution, which in this case is segregated email accounts. Um, I think the problem is that there's a whole space of potential technical solutions here, from an email list on which, with archives on which board members use to communicate with each other and that public, the public is able to email, um, 
to a dedicated retention address that is CC'd on town business related emails. And I don't feel like this motion as written gives the town manager the latitude to choose the appropriate technical solution and perhaps different technical solutions depending on the board or the commission or what have you. Um, so, uh, so I like the idea. Um, I don't want to see this issue go away, but I'll be voting against this as it's written. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Diane Mahan, town meeting member, precinct 14, and also a member of the board of selectmen. Um, I'm gonna throw myself on the mercy of you all. Um, the reason why I was, was and am not in favor of this in its current form is, when I first ran for selectmen, I thought it was like school committee and all those other unpaid positions. I didn't realize you get a whole $3,000 a year. Um, I, I do have two other quasi full-time jobs um, what I do right now in, in order to contact my constituencies is probably six or seven different main sites, whether it's my Facebook, I'm not going to promote my political website, but I do have a political website, then I have my Verizon account, and then there's LinkedIn, and, and then there's, I have to follow the Twitter and, and, and the tweets and all that, and you know, um, one of my biggest fears, because it has happened in the past, is um, I have lost things in the shuffle. There was a time, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago, there were town websites on underneath my name, and, and I didn't realize emails had gone um, to that account unbeknownst to me, um, and it was, wasn't something that I could manage. And once I found out about it, I tried to play catch up with some people that you know had sent in questions three, four months ago. In order for me to do my job the way I think I can do it most effectively, Right now, for everything that I'm maintaining um, and the way it's set up, it's what works best for me. Um, I'm not saying that this can't be solved in the future so that it doesn't ultimately work for me. Um, just speaking for myself personally, um, I know as an elected official, I'm always trying to think two, three steps out. And um, I know that there was the sort of gotcha um, example um, given out. But I also have to be very cognizant in, in my effort to get information out from the accounts in email and various form that I have now. Um, right now, I have the protection that if I'm just not thinking, and you know, someone asks me a question, and I, you know, I wouldn't ask town council um, right now to give an opinion on the floor. But it, there was a previous issue raised that it would depend on. There, there are times that I get um, queries from people that um, I do check with town council and give them the heads up to find out the appropriate way to do it. Um, I would like to think that if I slipped up, if this went through, um, if I slipped up and inadvertently made a mistake, that it wouldn't be pounced upon. Um, but I haven't necessarily found that um, to be the case in the past. So um, just for me, and I understand some people say, you know, have two different screens in my office at home, and I'm also a court reporter, MedMel, <laughs> I have four different workstations just for myself, and one of the workstations is my personal selectman um, emails, and all the accounts are on that. Another one is my court reporting for all my depositions and transcribing so the twain never meet. Then there's another one that I have for my assistant coach job at the high school that has all of the school links that I have to um, um, link into. And then there's the fun one that the kids get to use. So it's not a matter of just switching between two scre screens. I literally go seat to seat to seat. And right now, the way this is presented, I don't see enough in there just for myself personally to protect myself and to protect the job that I do for you all that um, this right now is kind of opening a Pandora's box for myself. Um, so uh, again, I'm at the mercy of you all. Um, it, you know. Perhaps if the town manager had time to look into it some more and, you know, we could come up with something in the future um, that could satisfy all those concerns. It's mostly the legal aspect of it. I think you all know what I'm getting at. Um, I'd be happy to, you know, make that happen. And as long as I can ensure, similar to what happened six, seven years ago, that my name's not out there on an email account that I'm not checking and then I look like I'm not responsive. 
So I would ask you respectfully right now to vote no on this, um, but I'll certainly endeavor to work with my colleagues and the town manager on something that might be workable in the future, because as we all know with technology, you can fix it, you know, as long as you check all the different roads and links and everything that you have to do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the gentleman who tried to terminate but couldn't. forever known by that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Greg Christiana, Precinct 15. Uh, so I, uh, I, I like the general idea of this, uh, uh, this article, but like Mr. Dennis, uh, I just don't support it in its current form. Um, I'd like to address a few of the comments briefly that were made earlier. Um, one was about Secretary of State Clinton. Her, obviously, we know all about her email situation. Uh, I think that's a, obviously a very different situation for the Secretary of State of the country versus uh, our, our town of Arlington, right? Very different scales of government, and I think it's perfectly acceptable to have very different types of solutions for these problems, and, and we don't need that level of security and confidentiality, I think, at this level. We're not dealing with national security issues. Um, uh, there was a previous comment about that, you know, uh, I think Mr. Uh, Mr. Tully, I think, said, uh, that he has two screens of emails at work, and a lot of us are probably in that similar situation. Uh, but if you're like me, it's like your, your work emails are, are of a fundamentally different nature than like your uh, kind of day-to-day -day conversations with like normal average people like on the street. Whereas I think those conversations that I've had, for instance, with school committee members like Mr. Schlickman, um, I think they blur the line uh, very naturally with uh, personal life. Um, and they have that responsibility of keeping that straight. But when I talk to Mr. Slickman, he doesn't have to put on his school committee face versus his personal face. And our, our, our direct conversations kind of flow over those boundaries. And it's his job to keep those, those straight uh, and have discipline about that. But I think extending that to email, I, I, am, I, I think, is a burden. And I think we're hearing that from some of our uh, officials tonight, from the Board of Selectmen's vote on this uh, and, and, and so on. So um, it might not seem like a burden, for your, person, for your private versus personal email, but I ask you to look at like, how, this, how your role at your job is, di is, more di is probably more different from uh, uh, casual conversations than, than these elected officials are. Uh, so I, and also, for anyone, any elected officials who are not fully embracing the spirit of this, um, you know, I, I don't think you're gonna get a very good result. I, I think you're gonna get a very confusing result that's gonna be very inconsistent and it's not going to have the desired effect. And, and like Mr. Dennis suggested, I think there, there are other ways to go about this that I'd like to pursue in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. I'd like to terminate debate on this article and all associated matters. We have a motion to terminate debate on the article and all matters underneath it. Um, <clears throat> All in favor of terminating debate, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, it is a two-thirds vote. Gentlemen, ready? Okay, we have before us the substitute motion of Ms. Pyle. First, we're going to vote on that. Um, all in favor of Ms. Pyle's substitute motion, please press 1. All opposed, press 2. 1 for yes to substitute, 2 no if you do not want to. Ninety-six in the affirmative, ninety-two in the negative. It is a, it is substituted. So we now have before us a recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen as substituted by Ms. Pyle's motion. All in favor, please press one as soon as we get the green light. Yeah, we're going to get a vote on this one. Okay. Okay, looks 
they've got a head nod and favor please press one yes sir a yes vote means we are we want we've already substituted miss Pyle's motion and we are now voting on that to direct the town manager to do all those wonderful th things she's telling us to do so yes if you want to have the town people have email addresses we're going to reset the clock because no one voted yet a yes vote means we're going to direct the manager to give all those people listed in the substitute motion email addresses and to use those for town business. A no vote means you do not want the manager to do that, in essence. So as soon as we're ready, he has to reset the clock. And go ahead and vote. One yes for the email addresses to no, not have them. It is a yes vote, 105 in the affirmative, 95 in the negative. It is a vote and I so declare it. That closes Article 26 and brings us to Article 27. Lobbying on public officials. We have before us a recommended vote of no action by the Board of Selectmen. I see no substitute motions. All in favor of the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a positive vote for no action. And I so declare it. That closes Article 27. That brings us to Article 28. Vote authorizing community choice aggregation. Ms. Mahan. Diane Mahan, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. Um, Article 28, besides what it appears on uh, page 13 in the Selectmen's Report, pages 23 and 27 in the Selectmen's Report has FAQs, frequently asked questions. Okay. And I'd like to yield the rest of my time on this um, Warren article to the town manager and his presentation. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Could you put my presentation up, uh, David? Okay. Got you. That guy. All right. Thank you. So, uh, similar to the process that I followed with the MSBA uh, high school feasibility study, I just want to quickly walk through the process, provide a little more detail than what was provided in the Selectman's report and the FAQ uh, provided by Mothers Out Front at the end of the Selectman's report. Uh, so, uh, to start, uh, what is community choice aggregation? Uh, I'm sure uh, most of you have read uh, a good deal of the material, but just to, to summarize, this is where the town can use its bulk purchasing power, all the residents and small businesses who currently buy from Eversource on basic service, uh, to come together and negotiate electric supply on behalf of all those users. Then the town, working under an adopted plan, can contract for both competitive rates and the percentage of renewable energy content uh, that is a part of those rates being sold to the town. So what are the steps? And these steps are also outlined in the Selectman's report. Tonight, we're asking town meeting to authorize the community choice aggregation or the CCA. Step two is procuring an energy broker, uh, and that is done by town staff. Step three, working with that broker and town staff and the division, uh, the state's division of energy resources, we would develop an aggregation plan. Step four would be approval of that aggregation plan by the Board of Selectmen. Step five is submitting that approved plan to the Department of Public Utilities or the DPU for their approval. Six is issuing an RFP for competitive supply to actually get prices from the market. Step seven, executing that contract with the competitive supplier. Eight, notifying customers that you're moving forward. And nine, beginning enrollment. So quickly, authorizing the CCA. Tonight, that's what's being asked of town meeting. An affirmative vote would set in motion all of the other steps uh, that we just take, uh, took a look at. Step two, procuring the energy broker. So why, would, why do we need a broker? Uh, the broker would provide technical knowledge in the 
designing of the plan, implementation of the plan, and then the monitoring of the aggregation if we actually did award a competitive supply contract. Uh, the broker has no upfront, upfront compensation and actually no cost uh, by the town government. Uh, what happens is the broker is compensated by the supplier based on actual kilowatt hours, and you can see it's um, a hundredth uh, of a penny for every kilowatt hour. We've actually, as a town, already participated in a collective procurement for a broker uh, with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, the MAPC. That procurement selected good energy, so the town has not contracted with good energy yet, uh, but we'd be eligible to contract with good energy if town meeting voted affirmatively to move forward with the CCA. Uh, however, Good Energy has a representative here tonight, Philip Carr, uh, who, if there's any questions that are best answered by the broker, he will be here able to answer questions um, if town meeting sees fit. So if we move through there, the next step is actually developing, developing the aggregation plan with the Division of Energy Resources. And this has to demonstrate how this aggregation plan will make sure that all residents have access, reliability, and equitable treatment of everybody across the town. Design the plan based on what we're actually looking for, how much energy the town needs, what the renewable portfolio will look like. And again, we have to work with the Division of Energy Resources to make sure we avoid any pitfalls that we could run into before submitting to the DPU. Moving on from that, before that plan can be submitted to the uh, DPU, it actually has to be approved by the Board of Selectmen. And before they can approve it, there needs to be a public hearing on the plan. So this would give an opportunity for the public to provide feedback at this point in the discussion on what the plan looks like before the board actually approves it. Moving on from that, if approved by the Board of Selectmen, the plan would be submitted to the Department of Public Utilities. The broker would actually be the one submitting it uh, for their review and approval. This usually takes the longest. My understanding, it can take anywhere uh, from six months or maybe even a little more, uh, depending on how many comments and how much feedback there is in the process. Once DPU approves the plan, we can actually then issue a request for proposals for a competitive supplier. So the broker issues that RFP, and that RFP really will articulate what's laid out in the plan in terms of the energy needs of the town. We can request uh, different supply options, whether or not how, how much green energy or renewable energy you want. And we can also ask for different terms, whether it be a six month, one year, 18 month, two year term, and take a look at what that actually yields in terms of pricing. And then the broker would work with the town to evaluate the bids and recommend a supplier. The next step would be actually executing a contract with a supplier. And I should say here, uh, there is absolutely no commitment to execute a contract with a supplier. Um, Ultimately, my understanding of the statute is that I would be able to sign off as town manager on the supply contract, but I would commit to not doing so until pricing parameters were endorsed by the Board of Selectmen in a public meeting. Uh, but again, if we don't get pricing that we think is fair and equitable to the town, we would not execute a contract. Next, we would begin to notify customers. Uh, again, as be has been described in the materials, this is an opt-out program. Customers would have to be notified by mail at least 30 days prior to their being enrolled. They would then have 180 days to opt out without an exit charge, and residents would be able to opt out over the, the phone, via uh, mail, or online. And then finally, enrollment would begin. If you don't choose to opt out, you would be automatically enrolled in the program. And then once you're enrolled, you would still receive one bill from Eversource, except your supply charge would come from the competitive supplier, and your delivery charge would come from Eversource. So I hope that um, was helpful in terms of the process, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. There's a woman over here on the right. Oh, you're next. Yeah. You had your hand up for I No, ma'am, you were up. Okay. Yeah, come on. You're up. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Jacqueline Chakrabarti, and I'm from Precinct 9. I'm speaking in support of this article. Um, my professional experience is I have almost a decade working on climate change and clean energy solutions. And I just wanted to share some of the perspectives I have based on my work. Just to start with the really big picture, climate change is happening already. It's real. There's more to come. And we need to do everything we can to reduce our uh, carbon dioxide emissions. 
we've seen some in progress with international, uh, uh, international discussions, and we've also seen some progress at the federal level. It's slow. It can be two steps forward and one step back, but it is happening. At the same time, we additionally need these local solutions. We also need solutions at the individual level. They're really important, and cumulatively, they can have a significant effect. If you look at the average carbon footprint of the average American, over 30% of that comes from their home energy. So if we can uh, take that carbon footprint, convert that energy use to a renewable sourced energy, then we'll make a lot of progress. I also want to think about Arlington and tell you what I see um, in terms of people's attitudes in Arlington. My offices and my labs are in South Boston. Every day I go out and I meet people who work across Metro Boston on clean energy. And it just surprises me that a disproportionate number of those people live in Arlington. Well, why is that happening? People move to Arlington for a number of reasons. One reason is that the schools are amazing, but there are many other reasons. You can get to Alewife and take the subway into town. You're on good bus routes. You're right on the bike path. You've got a walkable town. You've got lots of green spaces. I see this attracting a lot of people who want sustainable lifestyles and who want to reduce their carbon footprint. So really, I just see a lot of people uh, in this town who are committed to uh, making their life more green, to making our town more green. And I think that this community wants the, uh, steps like the CCA. I'm really happy to see a lot of things that the town has done already. It's great that we have solar systems on our schools, for example. Um, I think this CCA is one more logical next step. I'll just comment too that I know uh, when you start talking about renewables, there can be just a common instinctive fear of, yikes, surely that's going to cost us more. In this case, absolutely not. You know, typically, it's uh, a cost reduction and a very high likelihood that the cost will be lower. There'll also be greater price stability. And finally, it's really going to benefit the local clean energy economy, keeping those jobs relatively nearby rather than going to the fossil fuel companies uh, operating in other geographic areas. Is. If you feel like I'm just somebody who drank the environmental Kool-Aid and you've still got reservations, I'll just point out that you individually can always opt out. But as I say, I really believe that many people in Arlington want this. So I'm going to be voting in favor, and I hope that you'll support it too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gentleman next to Mr. Sharp. Ah, Mr. Cook. Kevin Koch, Precinct 16. So um, there, we're all talking about how we're going to increase the amount of renewable energy that we're using um, and, and uh, buy more renewable energy credits. Right now, there aren't enough renewable energy credits to go around, and it's a market. And therefore, the, the latest price that I got on my solar energy was 40 cents a kilowatt hour. So I, I, I have two questions. One is, if you, we do this and we load up on renewable energy and the price gets anywhere near 40 cents a kilowatt hour, which is what the state is requiring people to pay to the solar energy producers, what happens if like three years down the road the, the economics have switched around the other way and, and renewable energy is more expensive. What, how, is there any mechanism prescribed for how to get out of this? And the second question is, uh, when I lived in Belmont like 40 years ago, Belmont had their own municipal light department. And um, if, if they're still doing that, how is it working out for them? Are, and are they realizing cost savings versus Eversource? Chapteline. Adam Chapteline, town manager. Uh, to the question of sort of long-term risk here, uh, I, I would certainly be a proponent of us going for a much shorter time frame, uh, and that, that would be the way you would avoid any, any long-term negative impact from changes in the market, changes in regulation. Uh, so I would think starting with a six-month to one-year aggregation, monitoring that, seeing how it goes, and then making a decision of whether or not it is the right fit, uh, fit for the town from there would make the most sense. So by doing that, we'd be able to avoid that three-plus-year scenario where regulations change and uh, change the actual conditions in the market. Uh, in terms of the Belmont Municipal Light Plant, I, I can't really uh, answer 
um, in any depth of how well that's working for them, although it is my understanding that uh, there is a moratorium on the establishment of any future municipal light plants at th this current time, so I don't know that that's something we could pursue. Thank you very much. Um, there's a gentleman in the far back center. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Flynn Monks, Precinct 19. Um, may I ask if, uh, if we know um, what percentage of the town's emissions comes from electricity? The town's emissions? We know that? Um, no. I don't think anyone can answer that. Okay. Anyone have an answer? Do we? I have a secondary question, if that's Yeah, go that. ahead. Okay. Um, do we have a sense of how many residents uh, now choose a competitive supplier versus sticking with their resource? Mr. Chapterling? Adam Chapterling, town manager. Uh, my understanding from the Mothers Out Front group that's really been uh, spearheading this effort is that Arlington's percentage of those choosing a competitive supply is 11%, but I, that's my understanding via them. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm standing in favor of this article. Um, I think we have a chance here to make a real uh, collective dent in our carbon footprint, as we've come to call it, uh, which fits the town's own sustainability action plan, which was first presented on this floor, I believe, uh, almost 10 years ago. Uh, as a consumer, I've tried to choose more clean energy myself through mass energy. I've done an energy audit. I now drive a hybrid car. I used to, I tried to do solar, but it was too expensive. I didn't have a south-facing roof. But I represent just one resident. Um, with the CCA, we have an opportunity to get cleaner energy done in bulk, pooling our demand on the marketplace, ensuring we have a shot at getting a competitive price in comparison to our investor-owned utility, and secure that rate for a longer term than the utility can offer. I mean, that's basically price stability right there. That's a sell. Uh, also, opt out. I mean, we've seen this in our retirement plans. Um, people can select a greener choice on their own, but the forces against that are great. It takes time, energy, your weighing choices, and frankly, busyness just kinds of, kind of crowds that out. I mean, you may have noticed a number of calls on your landlines from competing energy suppliers. I get those about once or twice a week. It's confusing, isn't it? And the thing is, if you don't choose, Eversource already chooses for you. This is saying we're taking that nice, lazy, not choosing Eversource default and moving it away from the investor level and toward our own town level via our elected officials. That's a good thing. So choose aggregate, choose local control, and let's vote for a better planet. I urge you to vote yes on Article 28. Thank you very much. Gentleman in the suit. Tom Michaelman, Precinct 7. Um, I stand up here, as uh, somebody said, uh, there's a lot of renewable energy professionals in town. I happen to be one of them. And as luck would have it, I actually am working with the Good Energy team. I work for a company called Sustainable Energy Advantage. And uh, we're renewable energy experts, and we're uh, part of the, uh, the consulting team, brokerage team. Um, not surprising, I stand here before you saying, please vote for the article. Um, I have three very short points to make. Um, one, this is your best chance of, sorry, this is, how about tall or shorter? Um, first, this is your best chance if you haven't shopped to actually save money. Um, there's aggregate buying group. Um, it's gonna be vetted by the town. Um, I know a heck of a lot about the re retail electricity market and I have never switched 
providers since 1997, and I'm sure many people are in the 89% uh, that have not switched. Um, the second thing, if you happen to be in the 11% that have switched, you will not be asked to um, opt out. You're not going to be. Uh, you'll be segregated, and you'll be. Um, uh, you can stay with your current provider. And the third point is that this one act is probably the uh, single most effective thing we can do to move to uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions for the town of Arlington. Um, and it's just because it's such a big aggregation and then mass change that uh, we will be uh, doing something that um, um, above and beyond all the energy efficiency and all the um, implementation of efficient transportation that we could be doing. And finally, I said only three things, but I want to address what somebody said before. Uh, another gentleman came up here and talked about that their um, renewable energy certificate prices were like at 40 cents a kilowatt hour. What he was referring to were solar renewable energy certificates, um, which is a different class of certificates. And um, the class one renewable energy certificates are selling for about four cents a kilowatt hour. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Quinn. Ah, over here. Michael Quinn, Precinct 10. Um, I'm also one of the energy, uh, I guess, professionals in the room. I'm an energy economist. I do not have any ties to any of the parties uh, related to this at all. Other than I, um, about 10 years ago, I was one of the people who served on the committee that uh, this town meeting put together to be the power company feasibility committee, which would be the idea would be that we would buy out uh, the wires from what was NSTAR at the time and be become something like uh, the Belmont system. We've set up a committee. We looked into that. We found out that just legally um, we would never succeed. It would take us 10 to 20 years. It would cost us millions of dollars. We disbanded the committee, but we keep appearing in the uh, warrant um, anyway. <laughs> At the time, we also looked into municipal aggregation. This was probably in the roughly the, the 2003 time frame. We looked into that. We thought it was fairly interesting. Um, there was no discussion at the time about renewable energy that really wasn't something that was out there. When we looked into it at that time, it wasn't, it wasn't going to be viable. There really, we weren't, there was really no chance of us, um, of success for that, that there just really wasn't a lot of aggregation taking place. Um, and we didn't have any degree of certainty that we would get better prices for people. That said, I don't know that we can get better prices for people now. I hear these guarantees. I haven't seen the data on that, that we've seen one town, Dedham, or somebody like that. Um, the price promises about that concern me. And we take this vote today, we need to bear in mind that this is the only time this comes before a town meeting, and we're representing roughly 20,000 households. Um, I would be awfully concerned if what we choose to put in place as a town raises the electric bills to all of these people. Now, that doesn't have to be the outcome. There's a process, a 10, 12-step process that takes place. This is our one bite at the apple um, as a town meeting. And it concerns me that we haven't really, this is the only time we'll see this, we'll go off and do this. If we put something together that, um, that raises people's electric bills, I don't think people would be very happy with that. A lot of people wouldn't, and counting on them to opt out would be concerning. Um, I think I'm going to vote in favor of this, but it is awfully concerning that, um, that we're, we would be switching over all these people, and we might be raising their bills. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. O'Brien. Andy O'Brien, Precinct 16. I apologize if this question's already been answered, because um, I'm not familiar with all the terminology, but 
Uh, if someone had uh, solar panels or had a home co-heating and power generation unit in their home um, and they uh, had excess supply, would that affect the uh, price in any way that they might get from a utility? Uh, Mr. Mari. Mr. Chaplain, do you need that or should we refer that to the gentleman in the black suit? Well, you... Yeah, one of you two guys who seem to be the experts here. Uh, Tom Eichelman again, Precinct 7, this time representing Good Energy. Um, uh, what you're speaking of is um, when you have excess energy, you create, um, you're net metering, and you create net metering credits. Um, those net metering credits are still going, to, are currently and still going to be based on Eversource's basic service rate so they will not change. Thank you. I, 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 I very much support this uh, warrant article. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. This woman over here, five rows back. Yep. Pass, okay. Um, I can't read that, Mr. Dice. John? John Dice, Precinct 13. Uh, as you saw from his presentation, the manager is intimately involved with this process from, be from beginning to end. Now, any of you who have dealt with the manager, uh, as I have, probably know how well he operates and how uh, much he does a good job uh, about virtually everything involved in this town. So even though we may have some questions about how well this might operate, I'm more than willing to trust the manager to try to do it in our best interests. So I recommend uh, that you vote on this article. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Deist. Um, You. I think I'm short enough for it. I think I'm short enough for it. Um, Deborah Sorotkin Butler, Precinct 19. Um, two questions. Um, the Eversource has a monthly stable pricing program, would that be available under the aggregate program, do you know? Mr. Expert? Um, would, would, you, would you know, it's Mr. Carr? No, no, you, sir. Yep, guy in the black suit right there. One, one, one reality in-, in Come on up and introduce yourself, tell us who you are, Hi. answer uh, a question. Evening, Philip Carr, uh, Director of New England uh, Energy Sales for Good Energy. And my question was, is especially in an all-electric home, your electric use can vary rather widely. And to facilitate budgeting, one of the programs Eversource does have is to make available paying the same amount for electricity every month instead of, say, 900 one month and $75 another month. Uh, yes, you can keep that. Because the, the way it works, you still pay um, your bill to the utility, to Eversource. They still collect the money, so you can still maintain a budget payment plan. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, yep. I called you before, but you didn't stand up. So you can get up now. Steve Liggett, Precinct 9. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I strongly support this. I think it's a terrific program and a great opportunity for those of us to make a difference when we may be hard pressed to make as much of a difference as we'd like to make. I did have a couple of questions that uh, won't change my vote necessarily, but I was wondering if, do we know what the carbon footprint is for the town of Arlington today, broken down by town and resident? 
Mr. Chaplain, do you know that answer? Adam Chaptelain, town manager. I, I, I don't have that data handy. We could produce that for the town. Uh, I'm not sure how quickly we could produce it for the residents, but I'm sure that data is available, but I, I can't give it to you right now. Okay, I didn't expect you to get it now, but uh, I would be interested also in knowing the projected change in the footprint after this gets approved, which I hope that it will, uh, both in the footprint and then finally the monetary side of it if there's a significant reduction in the footprint for the town, are we likely to see any kind of a positive revenue uh, or I guess a reduction in expense? And I think the answer is probably you don't know or you can't give it right now and that's totally fine, but I'd like to request that perhaps reporting back on the success of this program at a future time. Adam Chaptelain, town manager, I think that would be a great idea and we'd be very happy to do so. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Foskett. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> Charlie Foskett, uh, town meeting member, Precinct 8. Uh, I think I understand, first of all, I want to say I I think I agree with most of the points that uh, Michael Quinn raised earlier about uh, some of his concerns with respect to the <coughs> potential impact on, on ratepayers. And I think I understand how the, uh, the purpose of the aggregation market um, and how it works. As I recall, the market was deregulated about 10 or 15 years ago and allows entities, individuals, bodies, et cetera, to uh, buy energy supply in a competitive market and then have the distribution channel uh, such as uh, Eversource deliver it to you. But I'm confused about the conflation of carbon footprint and the aggregation market. Uh, I'm far from an expert at this, but I understand that the renewable energy sources that are available in the market are more expensive than the non-renewable energy sources. In other words, uh, whether it's solar power or wind power, the combination of the cost of generation and the cost of distribution means that the cost per kilowatt hour is actually higher than, say, natural gas, which is, as we all know, getting lower. So um, I'm confused as to how the aggregators can deliver renewable energy at a lower cost if the data available seems to indicate that it costs more to produce it. And possibly the answer is that it's subsidized by either the state or the federal government. In which case, uh, perhaps we're not getting a savings, perhaps we're paying for the higher energy through another channel. And I wonder if the town manager could enlighten us on those points. Do you have the answers to those questions, Mr. Chapdelein? As best you can. Adam Chapsalane, town manager. Um, I'll answer the best I can, and perhaps the um, folks from Good Energy could, could add on. Uh, I, I would say, I, I would imagine the number one way that an aggregation can work to save costs is through the bulk competition. This isn't one person or one entity going out to buy uh, renewable energy from a source. It's 20,000 households, give or take, depending on how many people opt out. So providing that bulk competition um, it is a, at least a portion of where the savings come, uh, comes from. Though I, I think the detail from uh, either Phil or, or, or Tom would be helpful. In terms of um, subsidies, I, I, I guess I would argue there's subsidies for fossil fuels, there's subsidies for renewable energies, the government subsidizes home ownership, having children. There's a lot of subsidies in government that uh, support public goods, and if the government is deciding that renewable energy is a public good, there may be subsidies, uh, but I don't know that that necessarily has a, a direct correlation to how the decision should be made about this. I'm sorry. I didn't... You said there's not a direct correlation. I said I'm not sure that that larger matter should be uh, directly correlated to making a decision about this matter. Okay, well, I, I guess with respect to that last point, I'd like to disagree. Um, I think we are the government. That's why we're here. We're being asked to make a decision about this process, and I think we ought to evaluate all of the aspects of it. What's the, what's the raw cost of the energy? What's the benefit of the aggregation? And what's the impact of the town taking over the electric distribution system from the citizens in the community. 
So um, I guess, I don't know, maybe these gentlemen can tell us how we get renewable energy that's produced at a higher cost than carbon energy at a lower price. Mr. Carr, can you answer his question? Uh, yes, so that's a, that's a very uh, fair question. Um, oh, identify yourself. I'm put a record. Uh, Philip Carr, uh, Director of Regional uh, New England uh, for Good Energy. So, so here's the thing. So uh, right now you are being passed on power uh, by uh, Eversource. Now, Eversource has an interesting way of, 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 of procuring power, uh, to put it simplistically. So if you had an energy consultant come to you and say, I've got this absolutely brilliant way to, to buy power, here's my plan. Um, I'm going to buy power on two specific days of the year, and that is not going to change. That is my strategy. So that's, you know, are you going to hire that consultant? Well, that's what's happening right now. So you've seen some pretty intense volatility in your electric price over the last couple of years. There's a whole bunch of good reasons behind that. So, so as Tam Manager said, uh, one, one strong reason is you, you have the purchasing power. Um, uh, arguably, you could say, well, you know, Eversource is purchasing power as well. Well, uh, the, the real sort of um, uh, catalyzing uh, effect here is you can purchase strategically. You do not have to buy power in the middle of the polar vortex like Eversource did, right? So, so you can be nimble, uh, and that is a core advantage. So when you, um, you take out Eversource's competitive advantage because you can get the purchasing power, and then you can purchase strategically. That's why 90% of all large commercial industrial users uh, in the Commonwealth have uh, used the open markets for buying their power. So what this does is it brings all the purchasing power of the largest industrial user down to the residential household. So that's where you're going to get your purchasing power. So, so, and that is where we believe that we can do better than uh, the utility. So second, second point, so why would we be able to get the local renewable energy um, at, a, uh, at, a, at a cheaper rate? Well, um, linked to the first point, we have worked very hard to identify uh, kind of a neat, simple, but uh, relatively complicated operational trick, which is to essentially incorporate just 5% local renewable energy into, into the um, municipal aggregation product. And that's pretty meaningful. We worked very hard with um, really the, the, what I'd call the gold standard for re local renewable energy in the Commonwealth, that's Mass Energy Consumers Alliance, to pioneer a product uh, which got approved by the DPU, um, which essentially means that by flowing 5% uh, additional local renewable energy through all uh, commercial and residential accounts eligible for this program, you can have an absolutely massive uh, impact uh, on the environment with relatively little cost. We're look, talking about um, uh, two and a half maximum uh, tenths of a penny per kilowatt hour, okay? So, so you have eight seconds. Okay, so that, 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 that's my thing, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Foskin, anything else? Uh, I don't know who can answer this question, but doesn't the state require that Eversource or whoever provides us with energy has a certain percentage of renewable energy in that component anyway. And what's the difference between your component and their component? I think it's 10% or something like that. Just a quick answer to that, because we're over his time. Tom Michaelman, uh, on behalf of Good Energy. Uh, this year, 11% um, of energy has to be provided by uh, new renewable uh, resources, that's class one. Uh, that would be going up a percent a year, so if this program began in 2017, it would be 12 percent, and, um, and the aggregation program would be uh, 5 percent beyond that, so 17 percent. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Radosha. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bob Radosha, Precinct 11. Uh, as a, um, a participant in the 11% for the past five or more years, you know, I'm very happy with it. And my concern is, if this goes through, will I be mandated to opt in? Will I be opted in automatically, or do I, I have to opt in, I hope? 
Okay, not Chapman. out. Adam Chapsley, town manager. Y yes, because you're not currently on basic service, you will not be opted in. You would have to opt yourself in. Uh, myself in. Okay, fine. Uh, for what it's worth, it's like I said, it's been I've been 10% under the uh, generation rate, at least 10% for the last five years by going to an alternate source. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. I move to terminate debate on the article and all associated matters. We have motion to terminate debate on the article on all associated matters. Do I have a second? Okay. All in favor of terminating debate, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. Debate is terminated, and I so declare. We now have before us the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen. Are you ready, sir? If you want to have community aggregation, please vote one for yes. And two for no as soon as we get the green light. Okay, one for yes, two for no. Is an affirmative vote, 177 in the affirmative, 22 in the negative. <coughs> it's an affirmative vote and I so declare it. That closes Article 28, brings us to Article 29. This is Article 29, as I may have said at the beginning of the meeting, I'm gonna be stepping down on Article 29. I have assisted the proponent of the article, Mr. Dolan, in the um, writing of the article and the negotiation with the town manager, therefore I'm gonna step down and let my able-bodied assistant who you voted in this year, Mr. O'Connor, take over the chair for this article. Mr. O'Connor. And because I'm, a, I'm not gonna vote on this article, I will be abstaining. We have before us Article 29. I'd like to recognize Mr. Chapdelaine. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, as the body knows, uh, the Board of Selectmen is recommending favorable action on this article, so I just want to walk through the process behind uh, that fa uh, favorable vote. So Warrant Article 29 was filed by 10 registered voters and involves a request from the owner of the property at 54 Pleasant View Road for the town to release exterior lines which were taken in 1942. These exterior lines allowed the town to hold the property as unbuildable so that a roadway could be constructed at a future date. These exterior lines are the continuation of the same lines that were released by town meeting in 2014 in relation to the adjoining property at 55 Venner Road. As was the case in 2014, the town no, uh, no longer has any intention of constructing a roadway on this property. Uh, I've negotiated with the property owner and their legal counsel in regard to terms under which the town may consider releasing the exterior lines. This discussion was informed by the prior debate of town meeting uh, at a much prior debate in 2006 and then also in 2014. In regard to financial concerns, I took the position that in order uh, to consider releasing the exterior lines, the town should be compensated for the present value of the amount the town paid for the property in 1942. I also took the position that the town should be compensated for the tax revenue that it has foregone since the lot has been classified as unbuildable. Should the town release the exterior lines, the lot will become buildable and the current property owners will then get the financial benefit of the lot becoming buildable. Um, though uh, Mass General Law doesn't um, specifically allow for this, they do uh, have a, con uh, there is in Mass General Law a concept for rollback taxes to be collected when a property's allowed use is changed. Uh, and it was that concept that guided my thinking when negotiating this matter. 
And then finally, I also looked at uh, the amount that we agreed to in 2014 for the release of, 55 Venner, of the lines at 55 Venner Road as my starting point. So, in 2014, town meeting voted affirmatively to release the exterior lines at 55 Venner Road in exchange for $65,000 in compensation. Based on the proportional share of the square footage associated with 54, uh, 54 Pleasant View Road, the requisite amount uh, matching up proportionately with the $65,000 amount would be $28,000. So based on this, the town has a tentative agreement that would be subject to approval by town meeting uh, with the property owner uh, based on the $28,000 amount uh, should, again, should town meeting vote in favor of releasing these exterior lines. Again, the Board of Selectmen has moved favorable action in regard to this matter, and we respectfully ask that town meeting approve the release of the exterior lines in accordance uh, with the terms of the agreement. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Leone, did you want to speak to the article? John Leone, Precinct 8. I won't, uh, I won't address the article. Mr. Chaplain did a good job, but Mr. Dolan is here if anyone has any questions of him or me. Thank you. Mr. Ruderman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9. I'm can, uh, my question is, how was the, um, the amount of... Uh, compensation appraised, uh, was it trying to figure out the, uh, you know, what, what, the, uh, what the present value uh, today would have been of the money that was paid for, for the original taking, uh, plus a compensation for uh, the increase in uh, value of the lot now that it's buildable, plus the rollback taxes, or was it looking at the proportion of square footage in the lot so made buildable compared to the lot that we uh, similarly released restrictions on two years ago? Yes, Mr. Uh, Chaplain, could you answer that? Uh, Adam Chaplain, town manager. I guess to some degree, Mr. Ruman, the answer is both. Uh, the concepts laid out in terms of the amount the town paid back in 1942 and trying to collect some portion of rollback taxes uh, was what um, that analysis, that net present value analysis is what came to the $65,000 amount. And then using that as the starting point, uh, we did the proportional share of how we got to the 65,000 based on the square footage of the totality of the exterior lines. And then if you looked at it as a total, the $28,000 amount would be the remaining proportion. So if, if I understand what you just said, uh, we didn't do the uh, whole net value, uh, with the whole present value calculation again. We simply took, took the ratio of, of area today uh, of, of the lot in question compared to the area of the lot uh, back in 2014 and came up with a ballpark figure? That would be accurate. Thank you. Mr. Worden. Mr. Moderator, John Worden, Precinct 8. Um, when, the, um, when the last lot of interior, in, interior lines, whatever they are, uh, were, were, were given up by the town for a pittance of 60 some thousand dollars um, a couple years ago, uh, there arose in place of one rather modest house, um, two gigantic houses. And anyone who's uh, been in that part of town, uh, I think it's in my precinct, uh, uh, has seen these. Uh, these are the th uh, one of them actually was the one I had behind me uh, when we were uh, speaking about um, uh, McMansionization the other night. Um, it's a three and a half story house. It towers towers over everything uh, else in the area, and I'm sure that the. Um, the owner of that property, uh, when they sold it to the developer to put up those two huge houses, uh, got uh, a pretty good price. Uh, in fact, I, I, I know the kind of prices that the rare piece of vacant land gets in Arlington, and they are very substantial six-figure prices. Um, but I would like to ask maybe Mr. Chaplain how many houses they're going to be able to 
uh, put in this piece of property. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. It's my understanding, though, I, I think the, uh, perhaps the, the owner of the property could speak more to his plan. It's my understanding he can't add an additional house but could redevelop the existing house. Say again? My, it's my understanding that the square footage will not allow for the development of a second house but a redevelopment of the existing house. I see. Well, I, uh, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's a concern that a lot has, has been voiced uh, rather substantially throughout town and, and through the through the master plan, the uh, development of of uh, extra large houses that are out of out of proportion uh, with the other houses in the neighborhood, and 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 uh, and so uh, for for that reason, I, if, if you're concerned about that sort of thing, which a lot of people apparently are, I would urge you not to support this article. Thank you, Mr. Carmen. Dean Carmer, Precinct 20. Um, I rise to ask you to support this article. We had, there was, there were a couple of people have mentioned the 2014 article on Venner Road, but for anyone who was in town meeting before that, the Venner Road article came up in the late 2000s. There was a lot of discussion on it. There was a lot of debate on it. We didn't really have a process of how to go forward. I think between the first time it came before us and the second time it came before us, we had a process. And, and the reason the process is important is for a couple of reasons. First, it's consistency, but it also creates, I think at the time what we realized was a fair roadmap. Because what we're talking about in this situation is in the 1940s, the government took, well, I'm gonna, it's probably not the right technical definition, but I think of it as a form of eminent domain. They came and they said, we need this property for a public use. We need to build a road here. We may need to build a road here. And they held the property, and yeah, compensation was given to the owners, but they took it for a public use. And subsequently, many years after, they said that the public use that they needed it for, the road in question, they no longer need. They're not going to build the road anymore. So I think in a lot of ways, it's, it's unfair as a town meeting to hold a secondary argument now, saying, sure, the town no longer needs it for the public good, but we're going to, you know, we're going to kind of hold it as a bargaining chip because we don't like what you may or may not build on the property. I, I just don't think that's how the, the bargain or the compromise of, of em, any form of eminent domain, whether it's taking somebody's property outright for a public use or putting an easement or some kind of restriction on the development works. And so when we got to the same situation, a similar property in 2014, I felt we came up, or the town manager came up, with a reasonable compromise on how to do this. Again, a few years earlier, I thought the approach was quite unreasonable when the first time those, the homeowners at Fenner Road came before us. So. That's really what, you know, what, what I would say to you. The other thing I guess I will add is, and I think we talked about this in, in 14, there are a lot of these around town, these paper roads, these different restrictions and, and things like that. And so I think even though we're now talking about the second property in, in one area that was one sort of small taking back in the 1940s, these pop up everywhere. So I don't think it's fair to those homeowners, whether they're in, you know, East Arlington or up on Morningside or over um, by me on the Lexington line to, you know, to have a different path forward and for people to have to come up over and over again and, and sort of beg town meeting for their indulgence to release the property. So I'd ask you to support it. Thank you. The individual in the fourth row, fifth row, back here on the corner by the door. Yes, sir. Sorry, you were in the dark. William Burke, Precinct 17. I'm under the impression that on this piece of property, they have already built two center entrance colonials. The house that used to sit on the back end of, of the property, which the easement uh, stopped them from remodeling the original house, has been knocked down. So I don't even see why we're talking about this particular thing when the houses have all been already built. And I'd like to know why we're taking this up again 
after we've already discussed it back two, three years ago. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Mr. Klein. Christian Klein, Precinct 10. Um, I don't have any particular aversion to, um, to the recommendation. Um, my concern is that this is based on a plan, uh, the plan number 213 from 1942. If you try to look this plan up um, with the state records, it's very difficult to locate. Um, and it, a few years ago when we were asked to remove an easement on a property, we were provided with the plans. And we were shown what it would be like, and we were shown the quality of the site and what the situation would be afterwards. And that information has not been provided at all to town meeting this year. Um, and so I would ask Mr. Moderator that, could we have a description of this property? How big is it? Is it still two lots as is uh, in, the, um, in the original article? Is, what's the quality of the land? Is it, was the easement in the middle? Is it on the side? If we could have any indication as to what this property actually is. Mr. Chaplin, can you answer that please? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. The lot in question uh, is a total of 4,882 square feet. And it comes down, it's actually on the corner of Pleasant View in spring. Uh, and it, it's sort of the, at, the, at the end of a triangle that connects at the corner of those two streets. Okay. Is it a flat site, hilled site? I believe it's a hilled site. Okay. And it's, the, it's indicated here that it's uh, showed as lots 83 and 84. Do you know if those are still independent lots or if those have been joined? Uh, as f the documentation I have is that they're independent lots. They're still independent lots. And, but combined, the square footage is, 80, is the 4882. 40 Correct. Very good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mr. Moore. Christopher Moore, Precinct 14. I move to terminate debate on this article and all matters before it. We have a motion to terminate debate. Mr. Renault, are you ready? When the green light comes on, one for yes, two for no. For a motion to terminate debate. Please vote now, one for yes, two for no, to terminate debate. Okay, we're gonna, t we're gonna take a voice vote. All those in favor of terminating debate, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? I feel the chair believes the motion carries. We'll now take a vote. Mr. Renault, we're gonna need a vote for this. It's a two thirds vote required because of real estate.
Yes. Um, well, for the moment, because of the technical difficulties, we'll take a voice vote. If it's not unanimous, we may have five people arise and then we'll take a counted vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. I believe we have a two-thirds vote. I so declare it. Say it again. Are, yes. Okay. <laughs> we are there any more options for reconsideration? Then we are adjourned.